Welcome, everybody. We're so glad to have you with us this afternoon for a virtual meeting with one of our scientists. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Rachel, and I work with the education team at the Natural History Museum. Today, we're meeting with a special guest from our research and collections department. The Natural History Museum is home to 35 million objects and specimens. Our scientists use these collections to conduct research on people and nature, past and present. Each scientist has a special area of focus for their research, but together, they're helping to build the history of life on our planet. In just a moment, we're going to hear from Dr. Regina Wetzer, Curator and Director of the Marine Biodiversity Center at the Natural History Museum. The Marine Biodiversity Center at the Natural History Museum is the museum's core facility for the curation of marine invertebrates. Unlike us, invertebrates are animals without a backbone. In high school, Dr. Wetzer became fascinated with invertebrates, their bizarre forms and their crazy life histories. She was introduced to marine field work in the Sea of Cortez as an undergraduate and fell in love with both invertebrates and exotic places. Her research focuses on molecular and morphological systematics or the physical and chemical structure of crustaceans. In 2016, Wetzer and her team launched the Diversity Initiative for the Southern California Ocean, DISCO. This research initiative is greatly enhancing biodiversity documentation in the marine environment by applying modern genetic technology, calling on the strength of existing museum expertise and collections, making new collections and assessing and interpreting biodiversity with these new tools. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so we can meet our presenter today and you'll see me again in a little bit. Dr. Wetzer, whenever you're ready, you can pop on. Great to see you. I'm here. I'm delighted to meet everyone. You may begin your presentation whenever you're ready. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so today I'm going to tell you about biodiversity in the ocean and mostly we'll talk about what it is. What is biodiversity? So biodiversity is all of the animals, plants, algae, fungi, bacteria, large, small, everything all around us and it can be in terms of um, ecosystems, communities, species, we look at genes. And today I'm gonna to focus on animals. That's what I work on. And so we'll focus on the diversity, biodiversity of animals. So um, how did I get interested in animals? Well, uh, not everything is warm and fuzzy and large. Not everything has a backbone as we already talked about. In fact, most animals do not have a backbone. They are things like sponges, snails, worms, and pill bugs. You'll hear a little bit more about pill bugs in a minute. So um, I got interested in them as a kid. I loved outdoors. I grew up on a chicken farm in El Monte with a dog, a cat, and many other animals. Our family vacations were exclusively camping trips to the mountains, especially the high Sierras. I always loved travel and exploring. And then in high school, I had this crazy basic science teacher who turned me on to animals without backbones, these invertebrates. And he talked a lot about parasites and their bizarre life cycles. I was absolutely mesmerized by shape, color, form. The crazier, the more outrageous, the lifestyle, the more I loved it. Why settle for tame and benign? So after high school, as an undergraduate at Loyola Marymount, I kept studying invertebrates and yes, I had more crazy uh, professors that took us to Baja, California, and I got to work in Mexico and the Sea of Cortez. I learned about deserts. I learned to dive and lots more. From there, I continued on to uh, Cal State Long Beach for my master's where I studied the morphology of snails and how they uh, breathe on, in the intertidal habitats. And from there, I had, uh, only had experiences in all kinds of um, academic settings, but had no means of figuring things out further. 
fortunately, I ended up at the Natural History Museum. And this is a, a view of our, uh, from the Rose Garden. There's a hundred, it's a 107 year old museum. And uh, we are about keeping artifacts forever. So it's not your grandma's attic. It's a very well curated place. And as has been mentioned, there's over 35 million specimens in the basements. So we are a persistent library of this biodiversity. So we do bubbling engagement, outreach, education, things like I'm interacting with you today. We do exhibits. Um, that's the public side portion of the museum. And I work in the research side, the behind the scenes, in the basement. And instead of having animals in drawers, since I work on invertebrates and these marine things live, um, are, are kind of squishy and soft for some, for some, some of them are it anyway. Most of them are kept in alcohol, in jars, vials, in a room that looks very similar. We have miles and miles of shelving that have these little jars on them. So that's how we store them. So how do we study biodiversity? And how do we add to the biodiversity that is all around us today? Well, we do it in pretty classical ways. We get on a boat. If you're gonna start study the marine environment, um, you can uh, go to the shore, rocky shores right here locally off of Southern California or to a sandy beach and run a beach seine. And you can use nets and dredges and trawls off of the back of uh, other boats there, that green net you see being pulled up. We can dive in kelp forests or we get to dive in tropical waters. We also get to you know, go out to the islands. Here we are um, with colleagues going out to Anacapa Island on a nice calm day, trying to launch ourselves to do some survey work and all that gear has to be brought on board. We also have access to uh, all kinds of ship equipment. And again, this is lots of collaborators come together. Many people is working on a ship, working on the ocean is a very, very expensive endeavor much more so than if you're just getting to go to the shore. Um, this is a, a, a ship that's based here in San Pedro. Right now it's off the coast of San Francisco. It has two of these autonomous vehicles, these unmanned ROVs on board, and the folks that drive the boat and operate the boat and the lab techs are all the folks that make that uh, expedition happen. And there's only one or two scientists on board. Everything they do is being streamed live. So they do lots of visual surveys. They do seafloor mapping. Um, a very big piece of, that I'm interested in is being able to collect things. Again, working in the deep sea gets to be difficult. And so, um, you know, I, from my laptop at home, can ask them if I see something that's really interesting to please pick it up for me. And if they do, it comes up on board. This is the laboratory on the ship and the animals would get processed. They would get photographed and measured and properly preserved such that they're useful for research. And here a shout out to women. There are lots of women on board ships. So, and some of them drive the ROVs. So what do we do with the uh, specimens? Well, um, one of the many kinds of things that we do with the specimens that we have on these shelves in, in museums is we describe new species, new species that have not have given a formal name yet, that haven't been known to science. And I came to the museum to um, work with someone that um, really, really loved pill bugs and was curating pill bugs. It took quite a while. I, I got a fondness for them too. I managed to deal with all of their numbers of legs. My earlier um, graduate work on snails was much simpler. They're not nearly as complex on the outside, but I also have a fondness. But I work on marine ones. This is a picture of a terrestrial one like you'd find in your backyard. It rolls up in a little ball. So there's many, many species that live in the ocean. And again, I said most of these animals are really quite small. I'll show you an exception to that. This is a former student of mine, and she is leaning over a jar that contains bathynomus. This is a deep sea isopod, and it gets to be about two and a half feet long. It is the world's largest species of marine pill bug. Much loved. It can eat pretty much anything it wants down in the deep sea, and I just saw a video the other day where it outcompeted the crabs. 
That was pretty cool. So anyway, if you're interested in deep sea pill bug, type it in and you'll see all kinds of amazing footage. So I said we describe new species. We can do that by looking at their body uh, parts and formally describing them that way. We can also use genetics. We can use pieces of their DNA in order to make relationships, make family trees of who's more closely related to whom and, divide, and identify them that way. And this is an animal, again, if you've been to the rocky shore off of Southern California on a breakwater or so, you will have seen these things running really fast and how many you've been able to catch any of them. This particular um, one right here locally off the port of uh, Los Angeles and off the Palos Verdes Peninsula is one that is not named. It is not that small. It's about a inch and a half long. Well, um, this one is just, I think is just the cutest ever. It's a cute little button. This was a photo, it's a cell phone photo. It's not in very high resolution. That was just sent to me a few days ago by a colleague that is in Antarctica on a ship and they came up. That's why I'm so crazy about studying these things. They have amazing shapes and sizes. And this little guy is only about a half inch long or so. But you have to agree, it's amazingly cute. Another aspect of the kind of work that we do is DNA barcoding and environmental DNA. So we talked about all of this general biodiversity. And in this case, we would look, say, for jellyfish or worms and you know, crabs and snails. And everybody has lots and lots of DNA. Lots of the DNA is the same across organisms and a fair bit of it is not. And we can sample, you know, so if you have a stretch of a gene, we can look for areas that vary just enough between animals such that if you sample that area, you would be able to distinguish it distinctly in such a way that you would then, you know, like you would do forensics with it or the 23andMe, or you might be familiar with, you know, pedigree for dogs. So it's the equivalent of like the little barcode that's on your cereal box or the milk jug or those nasty little stickers they put on your fruits and vegetables when they scan them past the scanner in the grocery store. So you can have this little region that would identify and distinguish the jellyfish from the worm, from the crab, or from the shark. When you have all of those little fragments, those are the unique identifiers. Those are the unique DNA identifiers of A's, G's, T's, and C's, the equivalent of the alphabet that would make them unique. So say, for example, here we have a barnacle. This is a, a crustacean. This is an animal that lives here locally. And I know that this is Polysipis palmaris. So what I do is take a little snippet of the DNA, put it in the test tube. We would amplify that bit of DNA, make more copies of it, then send it to this fancy little box, a sequencer, do all kinds of chemistry with it. And then we would be able to read each nucleotide on, um, by itself. And then we would file that unique sequence that represents that animal in a public repository. So what can we do next? Well, maybe somebody else comes along and they don't know what this animal is. They would do the same thing, get the little piece of that DNA, amplify that gene, sequence it, go to that reference database that we have already built and voila, you take your little match and you compare it to what's in that database and it tells you that you have polysipes. Isn't that cool, right? So that's a lot of the work that we do with the DISCO project, the Diversity Initiative Southern California Oceans. We're looking at all of the animals without backbones that live here in Southern California to build such a database. So let's take this one step further. We can look at environmental DNA. So, okay, our little friend, the octopus here has DNA, just like the other critters I just showed you. And not only does he have his own DNA or she have her own DNA, um, it, there'll be bacteria on it. There'll be his last meal. He'll be swimming with fish and crabs and 
everybody. There will be all kinds of DNA in the water. So environmental DNA can come from water, from soil, or even from air, but mostly we do it for in the marine environment um, by taking water samples. So it can, you know, all these organisms shed DNA. They have skin cells that they're shedding. There's eggs and sperms and poop and decaying um, and dead things. You know, they can be big, they can be little, a whale could have swum by, all of that. And all that DNA is in the water and that's gonna be in this class. So kind of the same concept. We then take all that DNA, we filter it, we make more copies of it. We put it through another fancy high-tech um, sequencing machine. This one reads a little shorter regions, but still enough to be able to identify them. And now you get back a list of everything that has been in that water with the organisms. So you then do lots of bioinformatic manipulations and voila, at the end of all of that, you get a whole list. So not only the octopus, but all of his friends, everybody that's in his environment. So you've studied the entire biodiversity of the entire environment that you have just sampled. So you have a community inventory. And you know, a tip for future jobs, uh, for those of you that are interested in, in computational biology or bioinformatics and like math, I encourage that strongly. This is the field where biologists need lots and lots of help. This is a very growing place. So looking at what this looks like um, in reality, here are my colleagues are on the back end of a ship and they have a special bottle called a Niskin bottle. And um, they have their little blue uh, nitro gloves on it because again, we don't want as, we want as little human DNA mixed in there. Um, we want to capture the environment. So we use sterile conditions as best as we can when we're in the field. And you, this special bottle hangs on a cable. The cable gets lowered down. It can be opened up and closed at a particular depth. So we can sample different depths of the ocean doing that. And then when the bottle comes up, it gets drained um, into a filter where all those little small DNA fragments are now retained, again, on a very, very tiny little sieve. And then it goes back to the laboratory. And then we do the same thing. We amplify the DNA. We look at all the fragments, we get lots and lots of fragments back, lots of information, and then we have a list because we can go to that database that we had previously built with knowns to look at the unknowns. So this has amazing potential, obviously, because it's much quicker than having to bring up a big old fashioned net and having to count and sort everything. Um, you get a lot more species, depending on how you design your experiment, you can get everything from bacteria to whales, to birds, to fish, to worms, or just isolated groups. And it makes those inventories a whole lot less expensive. So that's really quite attractive. So we're using both these very traditional methods and these new methods and um, assessing biodiversity that way. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen and um, we'll take some questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Wetzer. That was incredibly interesting. And I learned so many new things about DISCO and the work you're doing. It's fascinating. Thank you so much for sharing. My we have some great, great, great questions from some students um, that I'm happy to kind of read aloud here. Um, Emily was curious, you were talking about research that you've done on islands. Um, what kind of islands have you traveled to? What does your island research look like? Yes, so I showed you that very little cute Antarctic um, pill bug, marine pill bug. Well, in the tropics, they are, that particular group is very diverse. They're not nearly as outrageous as that little um, Antarctic one. So I've done a lot of shallow water diving throughout the Pacific and Australia and Great Barrier Reefs in the days when we got to travel the Indian Ocean. Um, and I've got to dive in lots of wonderful places and meet amazing people. So yes, again, I have a big fondness for travel and, uh, and more than just my, my bookshelf of guidebooks. Right now I'm, I'm waiting to get back out. <laughs> That's great, that sounds really fun. And very exciting. 
Um, so we had another student who was curious, you were talking about those boat trips that you, you do to go out and collect specimens. Um, is everyone on the boat a scientist? What are the different roles that people have on those, on those expeditions? That's a great question. So there's all kinds of roles and I showed you all kinds of um, boats, some boats, um, we would take students out and you know, you would get to join us and you get to help bring in specimens and sort them on board. In other cases, like the, the Nautilus, um, there you have folks on board. And like I said, the data is live streamed and they do lots of ocean floor mapping. But there's all kinds of engineers, um, GIS and mapping folks, um, all the jobs, RV uh, operators, um, lab techs, there's all kinds of jobs. And that is the, the really wonderful part that, again, I early in my career didn't have opportunities to explore, but one can do that much more readily now. And I encourage anybody that's interested in marine things to check them out. So there's lots and lots of jobs. And I can tell you that we need social scientists. We need artists. Biologists usually are not very, I am not very skilled. I have been very, very fortunate. I've had wonderful students that are good artists and that helped me with my publications or public things. So no matter what your interest is, you never know how that can match up with a marine job. That's so true. And that actually segues really well into another question that we had. Is there, I don't know if you can pick just one, but is there a resource, a, a book, uh, something that you think would, um, you would recommend to students who would be interested in getting into this field? I would strongly recommend looking for possibilities of internships, of um, field trips. Um, there's not necessarily a book, but again, you're actually getting to see, you know, these kinds of interactions like you're having with me, I get to tell you that. I come of an age where that wasn't possible. We didn't have an internet. We, you know, had just classical books. So I couldn't imagine, I couldn't envision how I would be a marine biologist if I was not going to be a professor. Um, and it took me a long time. I spent 10 years in travel, uh, in, in wholesale, and um, I did bilingual travel. Again, I love to travel, so I used my skills there. And then, again, this was a days long before computers. People still have phone books. Who knows what a phone book is, right? Um, but as that has all changed and we now get to see people's jobs there's beautiful uh, you know abilities to do behind the scene tours there's you know ability to talk to scientists like you guys are doing right now uh, field trips if you can get them and that way you get to explore all different kinds of jobs and see what you what suits your fancy that's great advice um we had another question this is um from natalie you were talking a little bit about um, octopi and kind of collecting DNA from, from octopi. Um, Natalie was curious, what animals eat octopus? Do you know what kind of animals might be eating them? Yes, they, octopus is one of my favorites outside of pill bugs. I mean, octopuses are, are, are mollusks. They, they belong with snails and, and slugs and clams and the like, but they are incredibly smart, but they do get eaten and, you know, humans eat them too. So, but uh, they do try to get away. Um, yeah, they do get eaten, unfortunately. And many of them have very short lives, I might add. So an octopus of, of reasonable size, the ones here that live off of our shore, only live for one year. They grow very, very quickly. And we do get to see them on our rocky shores when we go out in the field pretty regularly. Very cool. Um, one of our students is curious, um, what has been your most memorable discovery? my most memorable discovery. I've had the, the, the pleasure of having all kinds of really wonderful ones. Sometimes we find animals that um, are introduced accidentally. Um, we get to describe animals that are sent to us um, by others or we uh, work collectively. I'm not sure I have a single one. Again, I like so much diversity that I find everything pretty exciting and I go from one to the other. Do have to finish tasks, but you know, that's a hard, hard to question. pick. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Always hard to pick. Um, 
Let's see, another question we had is, and this might be hard to think of one instance, but maybe a couple that you've had. Um, what is the most surprising thing that you found in the field or maybe in the collections at the museum? One of the most surprising things. Well, I'll tell you about a story that I, so early on, I, one of my first field trips when I, after I came to the museum, I got to go to Costa Rica. And I, like I said, I was working for this curator who love pill bugs. And there was this one group that I now study a lot on. And we found some and the little pill bugs were attached to the legs of little crabs. And that was very exciting to me. I thought that was really cool. It turned out that if you remove organisms from their environment, and there's nothing else in the petri dish but the crab, that those little pill bugs will go and hold on to them but they had me going for quite a while. And I had basically created an artificial situation that I realized later that was not a symbiotic relationship or a more common relationship. Um, my little pill bugs usually get eaten by fish if they don't hide really well. So I think that was a pretty surprising one. That's so interesting. Very unique situation that you, you had created there. Um, we had another question that might be difficult to answer and I've, you've kind of hinted at it, but Emily was curious, what is your favorite animal? At least right now. I don't know, right now I'm awfully mesmerized by this little Antarctic one. I have not seen one with little horns like this. I mean, really, I just, what a crazy shape. What a crazy, bizarre organism can that be? So unique and amazing. I'm gonna ask, I guess, one more question um, today before we close out. Um, what is one thing that you wish everyone knew about what you study or your work at the museum? The single thing that um, I, I have to work hard, but I have a lot of fun. I have the pleasure of working with some really extraordinary people. Um, all across the museum and in my own lab group. I get to do a whole bunch of different kinds of things, everything from field work to interactions like I'm doing today with you. I get to write research papers. It's just a diversity of things that I get to do in any one single day, sometimes a little overwhelming, but that's what gets me out of bed in the morning. And that's what I love to do a lot. And so I feel I'm very, very fortunate. And I encourage others to follow your heart, be true to yourself, and then pretty much the pieces can fall in place, so. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon and taking the time I to be with that. us and for the students that joined and asked excellent questions. Thank you. Really appreciate and spending time you, with Rachel. you. And bye. Thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and close out our program today. Uh, I'll just pull up my last slide here. Um, well, thank you again to our friends and our students and teachers for joining us this afternoon. We learned so much about the Marine Biodiversity Center at the Natural History Museum and all of the incredible research that Dr. Wetzer and her colleagues are doing at the museum. We'll have all the videos from these presentations on our YouTube channel for you to watch later. You can catch this recording and others at youtube.com slash NHMLA. We also have an Instagram account that you can follow at NHMLA to see some more cool things from our research and collections staff. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Bye everyone.